Do either of you have any questions before we get started? I don't. Okay. So on, well, yesterday, <laughs> we got into 9.2 and I introduced the idea of three equations with three unknowns, a system of equations in three dimensions. And we just got through one problem. And so I thought we would start with one of those so that we could uh, get just a little more practice before we jump over to section 9.7. So we actually have two problems that do this. One is an application problem so that you can see that we can get to a system of equations from a bunch of words. So I'm gonna go ahead and label these. First, I need to grab the right tool. You would think after several weeks of doing this, I would be better at getting the tool right the first time. But now we've got those three labeled, and so I need to figure out which variable I want to eliminate. And normally I like to eliminate Z. And it, not for necessarily a good reason, it's just that I prefer writing X and Y to writing Z. Silly excuse, but that's why, what I do. However, as I look at these, I do see that we've got a negative right there. And that negative makes it a little easier to eliminate variables. Uh, so I'm going to take advantage of that, which means I'll be eliminating y, and I have to write z. So let's just add 1 and 3. I'm going to take 1 and add that to 3. So we've got x minus y plus 2z equals negative 3, and we've got 2x plus y plus c equals negative 3. When I add those together, I get 3x, the y's cancel, plus 3z equals negative 6. Now, I could end there, but I think what I want to do, just because 3 goes into all of these terms, I'm going to multiply everything by a third just to simplify this down a little bit. I don't usually do this, but it works out well with this problem. So I'm dividing each term by three. And now I've got a simpler equation to deal with. And I'm going to label this equation four. Now, because I eliminated y, here, I need to eliminate y again, and I need to use the equation that I didn't use before, which was equation 2. So if I multiply equation 1 by 2, I would have a 2y, negative 2y, which would add right down perfectly. So let's do that. Let's do 2 times 1, and I'm going to add that to 2. And I make these little notes so that I remember exactly what I did to get to where I'm at. In case I make a mistake somewhere, it's easy to get back and find where I made that mistake. So 2 times equation 1 would give me 2x minus 2y plus 4z equals negative 6. And we're adding that to equation 2, which is x plus 2y plus 3z equals 4. So just add those together. I get 3x. Again, y is eliminated. Plus 7z equals negative 2. And that will be equation 5. So now I have two equations, equations 4 and 5, that have two, e two unknowns. And so we're back to a section 9.1 material. If I multiplied equation 4 by negative 7, 
that would eliminate disease. So let's say negative seven times four plus five. Let's see what that gives us. That gives me negative seven X minus seven Y or Z equals 14. I'm going to add that to 5, which is 3x plus 7z equals negative 2. So you can see why I multiplied equation 4 by negative 7, because now z will cancel. So when I add these together, I get negative 4x, the z's are canceled, equals 12. Divide by negative 4, and x equals negative 3. So I've got one of my variables now. And I can put that into either four or five. So let's take x into four, just because it has fewer characters to write. But really, that's kind of why I decide to do some of these things. It's just because it's easier for me to write it. And you more than welcome to do the same thing. As a matter of fact, I highly recommend it. Make your life as easy as possible. So now I've rewritten equation four, replacing x with the negative three that we calculated before. So I'll add three to both sides, and z equals one. So now I've got two, equa two variables solved. And I can plug those two into any of the first three equations. And let's go into three. X and Z into three. So we've got two times X, which is negative three, plus Y, plus Z, which is one equals negative three. So I've got, let me go ahead and work this out. Plus y plus one is negative three. So we've got y minus five equals negative three. Add five to both sides and y equals two. So now I've solved that one. So my solution is the xyz triplet negative three, two, one. That is the solution to this system of equations. That is the point in three dimensions that is the junction or the intersection of those three lines. And that matches the answer I have in the book. So I'm feeling even better about it. Do you have any questions on that one? Okay, it's a process and it clearly can take some time. But once you get into that rhythm and if you organize it well, it doesn't matter that it takes time. You get the answer fairly quickly and it works. Now, also, just as clearly, I can't have a whole bunch of these problems on an exam because of how much time it does take. So you would only expect a couple of problems that are three equations with three unknowns because we've got some other stuff we need included in there. Our next exam will cover chapters 9, 10, and 11. Now, in 11, we only have one section. And in nine, we have three sections, and we have four sections. So a lot of things to cover on this one exam. So don't expect a whole bunch of these, but get comfortable with how to do them. So when you see one, it might even be one just like this one. You can walk yourself right through it, just step by step, without any trouble. Now let's look at another one. This is an application problem doing the same sort of thing. We're going to create a system of equations. This is an investment 
And let's highlight some things we've got. This is total invested. Part goes in a money market account. Part of it goes in municipal bonds and part in a mutual fund. And I have underlined the letters I'm going to use to denote those three types of investments. After one year, she got $730 in simple interest. Simple interest, that was I equals PRT. Let's not forget that. We are going to need that. So as soon as it says simple interest, I know I need that formula. The money market account paid 4%, so that's one of my rates. Bonds paid 5%. Mutual fund paid 6%. Then we've got this 2,000 more invested in the fund than in the bonds. So find the amount invested in each category. That's a lot of stuff. I need to get that organized so that I know what I'm doing. And I'm going to use that formula right there to help me organize it. I have a money market account. I have bonds and I've got a mutual fund. There will be some amount invested. That's the principal. I've got a rate and we've got a time and the product of those three will give me interest. All of that here in the top is based on that formula right there. That's how I came up with the top stuff and this column right here are just the three different types of investments. Let's see what we've got. I know that the money market account had a 4% interest. The bonds paid 5%. And the funds paid 6%. Okay, and that was after one year, I think it said. After one year. So the time is one for each of these. That makes it a lot easier. So I know that the sum of these three needs to be the 15,000. I don't know how much is invested in each one. However, I've got this statement down here, 2,000 more invested in the fund than in the bonds. You know what? I'm just going to call this M. I'll call this B and I'll call this F as the amount invested in each one. The sum of those three is 15,000. The interest I make is PRT. So this will be 0.04M. That'll be the total interest from the mutual fund. This will be 0.05B. That's the interest from the bonds. And 0.06F will be the interest from the mutual fund. and the sum of the three gives me the 730 total that she got in interest. Now I just need to take care of that last little bit. 200 more invested in the fund than in the bonds. So the amount in the fund is 2,000 more than bonds. So I took that sentence and I converted it over to math. The fund is 2,000 more than bonds. All right, so that worked out pretty well. I've got my three equations now. I've got M plus B plus F equals 15,000. I've got Let's multiply all of these by 100. 4m plus 5b plus 6f equals 730 times 100, so 73,000. And now I need to somehow simplify this down as much as I can. You know what? Because one of these equations is already solved 
for one of the variables. That seems like it ought to work well for substitution. So let me substitute this in everywhere I see an F. See what we get. So I've got M plus B plus 2000 plus B equals 15,000. And I've got 4M plus 5B plus 6 times 2,000 plus B equals 73,000. I'm going to need to distribute that 6. And I'll combine some like terms. So now I've got m plus 2b plus 2,000 equals 15,000 from that first equation there. And the second one, I've got 4m. This is going to be 5b plus 6b gives me 11b. And 6 times 2,000 is 12,000. equals my 73,000. So I'm going to drop down a little here. Uh, move my constants over to the other side. You know what? Let me just move over to the side. Maybe hopefully we can follow that just fine. M plus 2B, subtracting 2,000 from both sides, gives me 13,000. 4M plus 11B, subtracting 12,000 from both sides. And now I have two equations with two unknowns. I'm going to go ahead and label these. I'm going to call it 1 and 2, though we've already well passed 1 and 2. I just didn't label them earlier. So if I do, say, negative 4 times 1 plus 2, I can eliminate m. So I've got negative 4m minus 8b equals negative 52,000. I'm adding that 4m plus 11b equals 61,000. And I get 3b equals, it looks like 9,000. I'd buy 3 and b is 3,000. So that's how much she invested in bonds. Now we know from this equation up here that the mutual fund is 2,000 plus B, which is 3,000. So F is 5,000. So she invested 5,000 in mutual funds. And we know that, I'm going to go to this equation now. That the total amount she had to invest was 15,000. So we can plug that in, these two in M plus B e plus F is 15,000. Subtract 8,000 from both sides. And we're left with 7,000 in the mutual fund. I'll zoom out a little bit. So you can see the whole problem. Now that is not nearly as well organized as the previous problem. Looks like a mess. I recognize that. Um, 
if nothing else, it highlights the importance of organizing your work while you're going so that you can go back and tell what it was that you'd done. Um, so sometimes my examples <laughs> are not the best, but this does show us how we can work out the solution. Have you got any questions? Okay. So that will end our discussion on 9.2. It's, uh, they're calling it systems of equations in free variables. First, we just solved one straight out that they gave us the equations. That one was much better organized. And then we took a, an application problem or a word problem, and I, you saw how I wrote in the, the words there to highlight what I needed to do and how it guided me to creating a table that essentially wrote my three equations. Well, it wrote two of them. I had to translate one of those sentences to get the third. Then I used a little substitution to come up with two equations with two unknowns. And then I solved with a little elimination. And you'll get to do something similar. All right. So let's jump now to 9.7 which is systems of inequalities and linear programming. And because this is fairly graph intensive, I'm going to work on another screen. Let me stop sharing that and share this. Some of you are already familiar with Desmos. If you're not, I recommend getting familiar with it. If you're going to take trig, it can be extremely helpful there, but it really can do a difference. This is just a website, desmos.com. You can get an app on your phone or on your tablet to allow you to graph things. And I think it's really handy at showing certain things, specifically some of these inequalities that we're talking about now. And these are systems of inequality. So let's take a look at y equals x plus 3. We've spent some time with graphing. We are pretty comfortable with that particular equation. We knew it was a line. y and x are both raised to the first power. As a slope of 1, a y-intercept of 3, all of that fits with what we're seeing on the screen. Now, I am going to change this to less than. We still have that line at y equals x plus 3. Only now, notice it is a dashed line. And notice that they've shaded the area beneath the line. So what this inequality is saying, and we've done some inequalities, we want a y value that has a that is smaller than you would get on the x plus 3 line. And so what I usually do is I go to the line at any point on the line and say, where would I get a y value that is lower or smaller than where my pencil is now? And I would drop it straight down. So I might come to a point like this and say, where is a y smaller? It's down here. In my math lab, you're given a little paint bucket tool and you'll click in here with the paint bucket tool. If you click on the wrong side, you can drag and drop the paint bucket to another spot and it will move the area you're talking about. And so that's how we would graph just a linear inequality. Now let me create a second one here. Say, what? Oh, we don't need capital. Y is less than. Let's do negative 2x. That's good right there. So now we've got this other line at y equals negative 2x. 
That's the blue line. Again, it's dashed. You know what? Let's change that so it's not dashed. And I'm going to do that here by changing this symbol to a less than or equal. And now look, we've got a solid line there instead of a dashed line. The difference being the or equal. If you are including the line, meaning or equal, you will get a solid line. If you're not including the line, meaning it has to be less than or has to be greater than, then you'd better have it dashed. And notice that we've got three different types of shading here. We've got the shading that was all pink, red, salmon, whatever that color is. We've got the shading that was all just a blue, and then we've got where they overlap. If you have a system of inequalities, you're looking for the overlap. And so in my math lab, you would only shade the portion that it is overlap. And so if instead of less than here on this first one, we had a greater than, now we are shading a different portion of the map. We still have the same two lines, only now we needed a y value above the dashed line, but below the solid line, and that gives us that purple color on the left-hand side. So you will have systems of inequalities like this, where you will be given a couple of lines and you just need to graph the two and then shade in the proper portion. Again, with just the paint bucket. We may see something a little different. Say, let's keep that one. And let's say we've got a, a vertical line. X is greater than negative four. Well, now we're not looking at Y values with this case. We are looking at X values that are larger on the number line than negative four. And so that's why we went ahead and drew the vertical line at X equals negative four. And we shaded to the right of that. If it had been a less than, then it would be looking to the left of that particular line. And again, we want overlap because we have a system of equation. And so we would just go ahead and graph both of the inequalities as appropriate and shade the, the right side. I think it might be useful for us at this point if I pull up the homework and we graph some of these in the homework so that you could see exactly what we need to do there. Uh, so let me go share. I just opened the homework. Let me go share that so you can see what I'm doing. I think you'll find the tools to not be too weird. It'll be fairly easy to work with once you've got perhaps a little experience. So here we just graph the inequality. If I solved for y, I would be moving the three over to the other side. So I need y is less than negative three x plus four. The fact that it's just less than means I've got a dashed line. So right away I can eliminate c and d from consideration. And I just need a and b. And I need it to be less than, so I need a value that's below the line. So that tells me A has to be the answer because B is above the line. Again, some of these are, are pretty quick. Um, and look for things like that that will allow you to eliminate half of the results. So here we're doing Y is greater than 6X. So I need a line. 6X has a Y intercept of zero. A slope of 6, so up 6 over 1. I've got this solid line here, but it needs to be dashed because it's just greater than, so I can click that and make it dashed. If I decide later that was a mistake, I can make it solid again. But this one I know I need to be dashed. And so there's my line for y equals 6x. Now I need something that's greater than, so I'll just grab my paint bucket tool and click up here. Again, if I pick the wrong side, I can just drag that and it'll change where it's highlighted. I need greater than, so that would be the one I want to use. Let's do another one. 
well, x plus y is less than 4. I like the slope intercept form, so I would subtract x from both sides. So it would be plus 4, that would be my y intercept. Slope would be negative 1, so I can drop 1, run 1, or raise 1, run 1 to the left. Oh, it's less than. Let me go ahead and make this dashed and go to the 4 again. Let's see, I think I lost my tool. Go to the 4, slope of negative 1. So I can dash it before I put it, or I can dash it afterwards. Either way, as long as it's selected, I can make changes to it. I can drag and, oh, that's creating a second one. I hope I didn't mess that up. And now I need my paint bucket tool. Oh, I did, because now it's solid. Y is less than, so that would be down here. But like I said, I just made a mistake by making that solid. So let's dash it. Check my answer and I'm good. Now let me get to a system. Oh, that would actually be a good one. So I need y is, well, negative 2 is less than y is less than 6. And they remind me that I can break that into two separate equations. So let's go ahead and graph those two. I need a dashed line at y equals negative 2. I've got that one. Let's get another one at y equals 6. There we go. And I need all of the y values that are between those two. So I'll grab my paint bucket tool and click between the two. Not too bad, but we had to think through what does that mean? Negative 2 is less than y is less than 6. It's nice that they give us that suggestion or the hint on how to approach that one. See if I can get a system down here. So here they've given us a couple of equations. Notice that both are solid lines, so I need or equal, and that looks like it appears everywhere. So let's enlarge this. Oh, that helped a whole bunch, didn't it? Can you see that? Good. All right, so this line here has a y-intercept of 0, and it looks like slope up 3 run negative 1 would be negative 3. So y is less than or equal to negative 3x. So I need that one. This one has a y-intercept of 8 and a slope drop one, run negative one, drop one, run negative one, or up one over positive one. So it looks like a slope of one. So this would be y equals x plus eight. So we need y equals x plus eight and y equals negative three x. as the two equations. We'll worry about inequalities after that. So y is negative three x, that looks good negative 3x is good. So it's looking like these bottom four have the y in, and negative 3x. Now we need less than or equal, so that limits us to these two, f and h. These two, e and g, are greater than the negative 3x. So we're only looking at now these two down here. So the other one was y equals x plus 8. And it needs to be less than that. Well, with f, if we moved h over or y over to the other side and brought 8 back to the left, we would have x plus 8 is greater than y, or y is less than. So I'm kind of I'm leaning this direction. If we looked at this one down here, if I moved the y over to the other side and brought the 8 over, we would have y is greater than x plus 8, and we don't want that one. So notice, by getting the equations of the lines first, I was able, with just this line that drops to the right, to eliminate the top four, because those had 3y equals x. And then I used the other line to figure out which of the bottom four it was, again, 
the less than made a big difference. Well, I guess it was really that one line right there brought us down to just these two. And the other line gave us the, the correct one. I want to create the graph myself, though. I enjoy that a bit more. So let's do this one. I need y is less than or equal to x. Well, y equals x looks an awful lot like that. And it's or equal, so we're good. I'm going to go ahead and do my paint bucket below that, because y is less than that. Now let's do the other one. y is greater than 1 minus x. So let me create that line. y equals 1 minus x. So that has a y-intercept of 1, a slope of negative 1. So it looks like that. I need a y that's greater than this line. Oh, I'm already there. My paint bucket here is less than the first line, but greater than the second one. So I don't have to actually take it and dra drag it somewhere because I lucked out and happened to get the right spot to start. And we should be good. Let's say there's one part remaining. What are the coordinates of the vertex? Oh, now that's interesting. So graphically, it looks like it's one half, one half. We could use a little substitution or something plug the x in down here for y, add x to both sides, so we would have 2x equals 1, divide by 2, x is 1 half. Plug that in up here, and y equals 1 half. So using the math that we did in 9-1, we can prove that it is 1 half, 1 half. Graphically, we had a pretty good sense, and we're good to go. Now, this is where we're combining all of this together. This idea of a system of equations with the system of inequalities. And that leads us into linear programming, which I'm going to get to now. But in order to make linear programming work, we need to understand where the vertices are, where the intersection of our graphs exists. And so now I am going to jump over back to Photoshop because I have a linear programming problem I want us to solve so that we can get a sense of what that is talking about. So with linear programming, see, I'm going to go ahead and save my work. With linear programming, we are going to have some sort of system of inequalities that we need to work with. And we will want to graph those. And then we and we need to find the vertices. Because as it turns out, the let's see, what are they talking about with this particular problem? They want us to maximize profit. And that maximum is going to occur at one of the vertices, always. And so what we are finding is a system of inequalities in which all of our answers could exist, and then we find the one that maximizes. And I'll show you what that looks like right now. So we've got this word problem. Aspen carpentry makes bookcases and desks. So we've got a couple of things that we're making, okay, books and desks. I'll call that B and D. Each bookcase has five hours of woodworking and four hours of finishing. You know what? I want to organize this in a table. So I've got bookcases and I've got desks. We've got woodworking and we've got finishing. So I have to include all of those. So a bookcase has five hours of woodworking and four hours of finishing. Each desk requires 10 hours of woodworking and three hours of finishing. So a desk is 10 hours of woodworking, three hours of finishing. Each month, 
the shop has 600 hours of labor for woodworking. So this is, well, I wonder how that happened. This is the max. I don't have any more than 600 hours. So that's the most I can apply. And 240 for finishing. That was also in the problem. The profit on each bookcase, so I didn't include that over here. So let's do profit. Bookcase is $75. Desk is 140. Assume that all that are made are sold. How many of each product should be made each month in order to maximize profit? So when I'm figuring out profit, I take the amount per bookcase times the number of bookcases. So that would be like 75B plus 140D equals profit. My total profit. There's my profit statement right there. $75 for each bookcase times the number of bookcases plus 140 times desks plus the number of desks times the number of desks. Add those together, that gives me profit. So let's see, I need to do something similar to there. So let's five times the number of bookcases plus 10 times the number of desks has to be less than or equal to 600. Four hours for each bookcase plus three hours per desk has to be less than or equal to 240. Also, kind of goes without saying, but I cannot make a negative number of bookcases. And I cannot make a negative number oops, of desks. So both of those, the number of bookcases and the number of desks has to be greater than or equal to zero. So I've got 5B plus 10D has to be less than or equal to 600. And I've got 4B plus 3D has to be less than or equal to 240. You know what, I'm gonna simplify this first one a little. I'm gonna multiply these by a fifth, divide everything by five basically. So I have B plus 2D less than or equal to 120. Now I've got some simpler equations to work with. Not a huge deal, but it'll help. So I need to graph these. So graphically, let's let B be our x x value and D will be our y value, just for graphing purposes. So I'm gonna graph 4x plus 3y less than or equal to 240, and x plus 2y less than or equal to 120. I'm gonna go back to Desmos to graph those. And let's see, we'll also have X is greater than or equal to zero and Y is greater than or equal to zero. All right, but I'm gonna to need to find, well, let's go ahead and graph those first. Let me go ahead and I'm gonna do something kind of weird here. I'm gonna share my screen and it's going to give us A tunnel, but that's okay. I'm going to jump out of that pretty quick, I think. No, oh, got to go back to this because I want Desmos. All right. So there's the tunnel. Okay. What I need to graph, let's start with those simple inequalities where X. I'm just going to use greater because I can type that on my keyboard and I'd have to find the greater than or less than or equal down through the virtual keyboard. 
So we've got that one. We have this one where y has to be greater than zero. And then the other ones we had were x plus 2y is less than 120. And I better zoom out, huh? Okay. And we had 4x plus 3y is less than 240. Okay, so now you can see the region we're talking about. It's just this region right here. And so graphically, we can see we have a vertex at 0, 0. We have a vertex at 60, 0. And we have one at 0, 60. We also have this other vertex, which we would need to find using our system of equations math. So let me come back here to Photoshop because I need to write down these vertices because we're going to look at our profit statement here and we're going to compare that. So our vertices were 0, 0. They were 60, 0. They were 0, 60. And one more that we need to find with our system of equations with these two equations right here. So let's go ahead and find that now. So if I do negative 4 times 2 plus 1, that will give me, let's see, negative 2 times 4, or negative 4 times 2 is negative 4b minus 8d. And I'm going to make them equations because I'm just looking for the vertex. And negative 4 times 120 is negative 480. And I need to add that to 1, which is 4b plus 3d equals 240. Add those together gives me negative 5d equals negative 240. Divide by negative 5, d is, what do we get, uh, 48. And now plug that into 2. So d into 2 gives me b plus 2 times 48 equals 120. Now I'll subtract 96 from both sides. And I get b equals 24. So 24 bookcases and 48 desks. Ooh, I should get this right. Yeah, bookcases are the X. We need to make sure we get that right. So this is all looking at BD. So now we need to plug those into our profit statement. So I'm going to drag this over here. And we've got our profit statement. So our BD... are 0, 0, 60, 0, 0, 60, and 24, 48. Now I'm going to plug those into the 75B plus 140D. So with 0, 0, we've got 75 times 0 plus 140 times 0 equals 0. Believe it or not, if you don't make anything, you don't make any profit. I know that throws a wrench in, in your works, but seems to be the case.
look at this one. 75 times 60 plus 140 times 0. So 75 times 60, I should probably do that in my head, but I feel like I'm running out of time. Gives me 4,500. Down here, we're plugging in 60 into this variable. So 140 times 60 is 8,400. So far, that's our winner. We get more profit that way. And now let's plug the 24 in here and 48 in here. That gives me 8520. So that's my maximum profit, and it occurs when I make 24 bookcases and 48 desks. That will give you, with this scenario, the most profit. And I think I heard a question over here. Nope, I didn't. But you all get the tunnel, so you got that going for you. Okay, so Desmos let us graph this. And normally I graph this on the whiteboard when we're in class, but we're not there. So I'm just taking advantage of Desmos. But what we've got graphed here is the region of all the answers that make this true. If I pick any combination in here, say 20 bookcases and 30 desks, it would satisfy all of these inequalities. But the maximum profit, the profit we're looking for, is going to occur at one of these vertices. In this case, it happened out here at this vertex, 2448. Now, Desmos, let me, it, it'll, it's nice, it gives you that. Uh, we can't use Desmos on the exam, though. So you'll need to learn how to do this, which we've already done, learning our system of equations. But then we just plugged it into our profit statement to see where it would occur. Now you do need to be aware that it won't always occur out here at this intersection. Sometimes it occurs up here at this one, and sometimes it occurs over here at this one. So you need to test all of those. I'm not gonna make you test the zero, zero, because we all know that if you don't make any bookcases or desks, you won't get any profit. But you will need to test these other ones to make sure that the maximum profit you're getting is at one of those vertices. So this is the combination of everything we've been doing. It's, it's our inequalities, it's uh, systems of equations. In this case, we only had two unknowns. And so, and I think pretty much all of them in this section will just be two unknowns. So you may be looking at soybeans and peas or corn or something like that, but regardless, take the words, make a table out of the information and see how that table lets you create your equations. And then graph your system, find the vertices and plug those into the profit or cost statement, whatever they give you, and look for the maximum. If this were your carpentry shop, you may want to take a look at that 060, 60 desks and no bookcases was 8,400 in profit. Yes, you get an extra 120 in profit by combining desks and bookcases, but what if you could limit your shop so that it's only making one item? Maybe you would get better at that, take less time, be able to get a little bit more profit, Maybe it's simpler for your workers. A lot of things you need to consider when doing your own business. But this is a good business model, uh, a good way to figure out what, how you will maximize your profit. I had a student do a signature assignment like this for their mom's candy shop. Figured out which option worked best for her to make the most profit. And it seemed to work pretty well. Are there any questions before we move on? 
All right, not move on. We're going to call it a day because I'm a couple of minutes past out of time. So any questions before we go? All right, have a good weekend. Don't forget the exam is due by tomorrow at midnight. I noticed four or five have already taken the exam. I don't know if those are any of you, but if you haven't, make sure you finish the chapter five homework and quizzes and then go ace the exam. And have a good weekend. Thank you, you too. Thanks.